Don't know about you, but I needed a morning like this where we could just breathe. Where we could just kind of take that, that deep breath in. And with the gift of the Spirit uh, that lives within each one of us, experience the love and the kindness and the care and the mercy of Jesus. Uh, really sweet morning uh, together. A, a few weeks back, uh, my wife and I were doing some work in the garden and I decided to attempt to give myself a manicure in, in the garden with a chainsaw. It's, it's not actually like, oh, for the purpose of this illustration, I tried to cut my thumb off with a chainsaw. But actually what was happening is we were taking out some shrubs out of the backyard. And if you've ever used a chainsaw before, you know they can get a little jumpy at times. And so I had the chainsaw on one of these shrubs and the chainsaw took a jump off of the shrub onto my thumb. And like any typical guy, this was just kind of a moment for me where I'm like, you know what? I'll take a paper towel and a little bit of duct tape, and I'll be fine. But thankfully, uh, people wiser than me, namely my wife, pushed me to, at bare minimum, just go get a tetanus shot, right? Let's, let's, take care of, let's take care of just the minimum here. And while you're getting the tetanus shot, have the doctor look over, and the doctor looked over my thumb and said, you know what, I really wish you would have come in earlier because we could have sewn this up and uh, really really taken better care of it than just duct tape and a paper towel. Uh, but good news is, spoiler alert, I'm not going to lose my thumb, which is, see what I did? Thumb, I'm not, it's, you can laugh at me. I, I almost chopped my thumb off with a chainsaw. Uh, but uh, good news is I'm not going to lose my thumb. Uh, even better news As we walk through the Sermon on the Mount, how's the pastor going to tie this into Jesus? As we walk through the pastor, the Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus has been doing throughout this sermon in the lives of the people who are listening, as well as in our own life today, is Jesus has been uh, doing a deep dive, drill down. This isn't like surface level paper cut, which at times can hurt like a chainsaw cut, but Jesus is drilling deep into the issues that are going on in our heart and in our lives to drill down into the motivation. And what he's done week after week, word after word, verse after verse, is he's taken this deep dive, not with a chainsaw, but with a surgical scalpel to restore and redeem and refresh places of our hearts that are not shaped to be like him. As we teach through a text like this, when we're in a series where we're walking verse by verse and word by word, there's no choice for us but to go word for word and verse by verse through the text. We can't kind of pick and choose, oh, let's cover this topic and not cover this topic. And So we address what Jesus addresses in a series like this. And what we're going to drill into today is a passage that has often been misunderstood. It's a text that for for hundreds of years has been passionately debated. It's this topic of divorce and marriage. It's this conversation of remarriage and unfaithfulness. It's relational betrayal. And all of these topics are accompanied by deep emotions times these conversations can come with profound wounds and strong feelings because for all of us, we've all been affected directly or indirectly by broken marriages. Maybe your family has gone through brokenness in marriage. Maybe there's been infidelity. The repercussions of these things on your family and your friends and your communities are still being felt today. Maybe you're here today and your parents got divorced when you were a kid. And the wounds of that are still impacting your life and your relationships today. Maybe for you, you've, you've gone through a divorce. And, and the painful realities of a broken marriage are still hitting in sensitive areas of your heart today. Maybe you're walking through a divorce as we speak. Maybe your marriage just hasn't turned out the way that you had hoped and dreamed. 
Maybe you're fighting and contending for your marriage every single day. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're single and you're just rolling your eyes. Oh, here we go again, another church giving another message on marriage when here I am single, but I believe that Jesus has a word for you today just like he's got a word for those of us who are married. Let me remind you that Jesus himself was single. Maybe you wonder if God's got a word for you today because you've been married for decades and divorce has never been on your radar. Murder has, but not divorce. And, and you're committed to your marriage and you're wondering, what could God have to say to me? Would you just lean in for a moment? Would you just, would you just ask God, what do you have for me wherever I'm at today? Because I believe that God has a word for us. Depending on where you're at personally or relationally today, the words of Jesus could feel comforting. But on the flip side, the words of Jesus may feel confronting and painful, maybe even bristly. Maybe it could be just reminiscent of some of the most painful memories of your entire life. If I'm being honest, this is one of those topics which I, I, I just wish that Jesus himself could preach. Like, hey, we've got a guest speaker today, Jesus of Nazareth. Would you give a warm Mountain View welcome to Jesus? But here's the thing. I'm not sure we would like what Jesus had to say because I know that the people in Jesus' day didn't like what he had to say about divorce and marriage. Now, from the outset, I want you to know that I can't possibly, in the next two hours that I have to preach, I can't possibly cover every nuance of every detail of every specific situation. But what I will commit to you this morning is I'm going to faithfully teach what Jesus says about this. Now, we're going to cover a whole lot of territory in just two short verses. So if you've got your Bibles, grab your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 5, buckle up because here we go. Matthew 5, verse 31, Jesus says this, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What a lovely and uplifting passage that we have today. Jesus uses this phrase that he's already used twice. Now, this is the third time that Jesus uses this phrase, you have heard it said which is part of the six antitheses of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He quotes the law, but he doesn't just say, stay on the surface. He drills down under the surface of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. But this is kind of one of those passages that instantly and immediately begs questions to be asked. Okay, so, so Jesus, is it ever okay to get divorced? If so, when? Uh, okay, Jesus... If I am divorced, is it okay to get remarried? If so, when? But before we come with all of our questions for Jesus, trying to find something to validate some position that we have or some idea or some opinion that we have, I want us to dig into the text, uh, to, to unpack a little bit of the original context to see what this means for us now, because in the first century, as people were hearing Jesus live and in person teach this, this was a, a group of people who were living in the Roman Empire, living in the context of Roman occupation and Roman oppression, which meant they had very few legal rights. Uh, women had very few legal rights. Essentially, women were their husband's possession. Their husband would have owned a home, they would have owned maybe some livestock and animals. They would have had some land, and then they would have had a wife. And in the first century Roman Empire, a husband's wife was expected to run the home, to care for the children, but oftentimes that was it. Companionship and pleasure were oftentimes found elsewhere than the marriage. Fidelity in that moment of history was almost non-existent. And it's into this culture, into this context that Jesus says this. You've heard it said, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now, Jesus is referring back to an Old Testament law, the law of Moses, the law that 
guided everyone's life in that cultural moment. The law was this in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1 through 4, says this, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the, the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of her house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she's been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Is anybody thoroughly confused yet? Like, I just feel like we need one of those, like, CSI flannel graphs to kind of connect the dots with all the yarn here. Who killed who? Who was here? What's going on here? We're all thoroughly confused after this. But what you may not know, a little bit of biblical history here, is that this Old Testament passage was actually the inspiration for the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> not, not actually. I, I'm just joking. But there was an intense debate in Jesus' day, and Jesus' culture around divorce. And this passage from Deuteronomy 24 was at the center and at the heart of the debate, which says that if, if a husband finds any sort of indecency, and this is this Hebrew phrase, debar eravat, which is later to become this whole conversation around talking about divorce. So if somebody says, some indecency, debar eravat, we know that they're talking about divorce. And so you had two sides of the, the conversation when it came to divorce. You had conservative rabbis who would say that, uh, well, what the text means here is uh, some indecency when it comes to adultery. And so some rabbis would say the only reason that you can get a divorce is because of adultery, because of infidelity. This is the deber uh, ervat. The other side, on the more liberal reading of the rabbis here, would interpret this to, to mean that if you found, if a husband found anything that they didn't like about their wife, any reason would be good enough for the husband if you fall out of love with her, if she doesn't make you happy. There was literally a quote that was regularly read in some temples that said, if she burns the bread, divorce her. This would have been the, the liberal view of uh, interpreting this particular law. And this liberal view of anything you want, any, any indecency, anything you don't like about your wife, was the majority held view in Jesus' day. And so it just became super easy to walk away with a no-fault divorce. And so as Jesus brings this up in the Sermon on the Mount, you've got to believe that everyone's leaning in at the moment, wondering, what is Jesus going to say? And so Jesus lands on the side of saying, adultery is reasonable grounds for divorce. He lands on the conservative side. And some of you are like, well, of course he lands on the conservative side. But can I say that there are other teachings of Jesus where he lands on the liberal side because the reality is Jesus is too liberal for the conservatives and too conservative for the liberals, and maybe he still is today. He's an equal opportunity offender of all of us. And so as Jesus is speaking about marriage, this is what he says in verse 32. You've heard it said, this is the law, de bear ervat, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds sexual immorality makes her commit adultery and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery jesus uses this word this greek word porneia which is uh, where we get the english word pornography where we unpack this whole idea of sexual immorality and kaimana walked us through uh, lust last week and uh, that lust could be any sexual act outside of marriage now this wasn't actually the only time Jesus talked about marriage. He talked about marriage another time, a little bit later in his ministry, in Matthew chapter 19. But the setting wasn't a sermon. 
the setting was the Pharisees asked a question of Jesus, and Jesus wasn't in the region of Galilee. He was in the region of where Herod was ruler. This is actually the same region where John the Baptist was imprisoned and later arrest, or he was arrested, imprisoned, and later killed because of his teachings on divorce and remarriage. So it's interesting as Jesus is talking about marriage again, he's doing so in Herod's backyard. And if you remember anything about Herod in history, Herod had a very unique divorce and remarriage situation. Herod actually married his brother's wife who also happened to be his niece. No, this wasn't set in rural Alabama. No, this was actually uh, in a region known as Para. And so Jesus is teaching on this, and the Pharisees asked Jesus the question in Matthew 19, verse 3, and the Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? They're essentially asking, how can you get out of your marriage? And Jesus, in this moment, in answering their question, drops a dime, he spits fire, and goes all the way back to the very beginning, back to creation, to talk about God's definition of marriage. Look at what Jesus says in response. He answered, have you not read? There's a little bit of irony here, because these religious leaders ought to have known the answer to this, but Jesus says, haven't you read? that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This is one of those phrases that is so often quoted in marriage ceremonies. But can I just say, despite what we hear in culture today, Jesus' definition of marriage is and always has been between one man and one woman. This is not unclear. This is not disputable. Any other definition is trying to make the Bible say something that the Bible doesn't say. Jesus says a man and a woman will come together and become one flesh. No longer two, but one. Translation, marriage is not just a ceremony. Marriage is not just a license that you get from the state. Marriage is not just a honeymoon that you go on. Jesus flips the script on the religious leaders here and says, what you're really asking me is, after two people become one, how does one person become two again? Because what God has joined together, let no one separate. It sounds pretty permanent, right? But Jesus, you you don't understand the complexities of life. But what Jesus is doing is he's drilling down and delineating the difference between a biblical command and a biblical concession. You see, when Moses was teaching the Israelites the law, he wasn't teaching that divorce is a good thing. No, divorce is always sad. Divorce is always painful. It's never celebrated. Moses was accepting that divorce was a reality and putting some safeguards around it, mostly to protect the exploitation of vulnerable women. But divorce was never God's heart for marriage. Jesus offers divorce as a concession, and he gets underneath and starts to highlight what's happening at times in marriage is he's saying our hearts get hardened, this phrase that literally means an an inability to understand because of a rebellious attitude. There are times in our marriage where our heart gets so hardened that it becomes tough to watch people hurt one another, to watch their, their, their life story that was joined together but now become painfully torn apart. Now, now just as an aside, I don't believe that Jesus was providing an exhaustive list of every acceptable reason to get a divorce. Paul unpacks more about marriage and divorce in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but I believe that there are three biblical exceptions in marriage for divorce. There's the exception of adultery, which Jesus covers. There's the exception of abandonment, and there's the exception 
of abuse. Listen, if somebody is being abused, if someone has been abandoned, the church, we all as the church need to do whatever we can to immediately get them out of that situation and into a safe environment. And so I believe those are the the exceptions when it comes to marriage and divorce, abuse, adultery, and abandonment. But in the second and third centuries, before the conversion of Constantine, early Christians had such a commitment to each other through the demonstration of a godly marriage that the pagan world looked at Christians and were amazed. At a time in the Roman world when people just abandoned marriage altogether, some of the wealthy in the Roman Empire wouldn't even get married. They would just... Uh, just go from relationship to relationship, and the Christians stood in a beautiful contrast to the pagan world. And so as we come back to the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus is saying to his followers, you are the salt and the light to the world around you, I think Jesus' desire for Christian marriage was to be a display of the relationship between Jesus and his church, a faithful and loyal covenant, which means for you and for me today that biblical marriage is about a covenant to one another, not about a contract between each other. Scott McKnight, theologian and commentator, says this, this covenant understanding of love means marital love reflects God's love, which means a divorce destroys the reflection of the God who is utterly faithful To end the confusion about marriage, we have to grasp what love means. We tend to think more about marriage as a contract in which two parties come together in a legal agreement that's mutually beneficial. And then when one party breaks that contract with adultery or uh, whatever, we think, okay, I'm out, and I've got biblical grounds for divorce. But what's important to point out is that biblical grounds for divorce isn't actually Bible language. It's language that's been borrowed from contract law. So what does this mean? Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. So we got to quit thinking about marriage like lawyers and start thinking about marriage like lovers. See, a strong marriage isn't built on strong chemistry. It's built on a strong commitment. I've heard so many times in premarital counseling, and in the middle of marriage counseling, in divorce care counseling. Well, pastor, marriage is all about compromise. It's all about meeting in the middle. Here's the only problem with that. I just can't square that idea with Scripture. Marriage is not 50-50. Divorce is 50-50. Marriage is 100-100. We tend to think about compromise and, and, and how can we meet in the middle, but yet time and time again in Scripture, I see that marriage is all about sacrificing everything for the good of your spouse, giving up your rights so that you can serve someone else. A, a good spouse has seen you at your worst and still chooses to believe the best about you. You want an unhappy marriage? Then obsess about all of the things that you want to change about your spouse. If you want a happy marriage, stay focused on all of the things that you need to change about yourself. Your spouse is not responsible for your happiness. Don't put that pressure on them. The happiest couples that I know have usually endured a lot of sad times together. The strongest couples that I know have learned to lean on each other in moments of weakness. Yes, we all prefer easy days, but love grows most in the hard days. If you, want to start, if you want a strong marriage, it starts the day a husband and wife stop fighting with each other and learn to start fighting for each other. In every argument that you have with your spouse, remember that there won't be a winner and a loser You're partners in everything. You are one. And so you'll either win together or you'll lose together. So work together to find a solution. Maybe this morning you're in a difficult marriage. Can I just say marriage is the single most challenging relationship 
of our entire lifetime. There, yes, there are seasons of great blessing and great joy, but there are also seasons of challenge, and maybe you're in one of those seasons right now. I may not know all the specifics of the details of your difficulties. Maybe you're divorced. Maybe you had a brutal, hard divorce. Maybe you were abandoned, abused. Maybe you experienced adultery, infidelity. Maybe you've committed adultery. There's, there's got to be some gut-wrenching and agonizing pain represented in the room today. Maybe you've made choices that you're just not proud of. Maybe things have been done to you that hurt you deeply. Wherever you find yourself today, our Heavenly Father, His Son Jesus, looks at you with compassion, care, tenderness, mercy, and grace. Regardless of your story, God looks at you with love and with grace. But Brandon, you don't, you, you don't know my situation. And you're right, I don't. I don't know your situation, but I do know our Savior. And can I just remind you how Jesus handled the woman caught in adultery? Uh, the Pharisees bring this woman out. And they remind Jesus that the law of Moses says that this woman should be stoned to death. Jesus says, okay, great. Let anyone who hasn't sinned cast the first stone. And one by one, people start to drop their rocks. And they start to dissipate. Likely because they understood the reality that you and I understand. Life is hard. Life is more challenging and more complex than you might think. Jesus doodles something in the dirt, and then he gets up and he says this to this woman. In John chapter 8, verse 10, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Listen, if you are feeling a sense of shame, if you've made mistakes, if your marriage didn't work out, Jesus does not condemn you. I don't condemn you, and neither does this church. Can I just point out the order for a second here? The order in this text really matters because Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He doesn't say go and sin no more so that then I won't condemn you. No, he says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The order really matters because that's the gospel. This message of Jesus is not a message about behavior. It's a message of we all in our marriage need the grace of God, the grace of each other. So maybe you're here today and your marriage is on the rocks. Maybe, maybe your divorce is in progress. Maybe your divorce is finalized. Maybe you're the one who messed things up. Maybe you're the one who's been hurt or abandoned or abused. Wherever you're at, can I just encourage you, can I just invite you not to do this on your own? It's okay to say, I'm not okay. Get help. And I want you to know that I'm not just saying, go and figure it out, go and find help. No, we actually have help that we would love to offer you here at Mountain View Church. We have a ministry called a restoration ministry where you can walk through with someone who's been trained to walk through incredibly difficult seasons and help you to discover health and healing and restoration from whatever you're carrying. Maybe for some of you, it's just time that you say, look, I need to go to see a therapist. There's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with getting help. Maybe you're here this morning and you just need somebody to put their arms around you and pray over you. To pray over you as you're still trying to heal from a divorce. Pray over you as you're contending for your marriage and fighting for your relationship. Pray over you as you're praying for your relationship. Wherever you're at today, we would love to pray for you. We'd love to 
resource you, to help you in taking the steps toward health and healing. Wherever you're at today, you are not alone. So don't go it alone. Let's pray. Jesus, we're, we're grateful for the hard words that you have spoken about marriage and divorce. We're grateful for the clarity that you've provided. And yet, even in our gratitude, God, we're, we're still bringing our pain and our hurt and our trauma, but we're just bringing it to you instead of holding it all to ourselves. So God, in this moment, would you, would you begin to bring healing to those tender parts of the hearts who've experienced hurt? Would you begin to bring help to those who felt all alone in this process? God, would you in some way, in your way, would you work? Would you pour out your grace, remind us of your love? It's in Jesus' name we pray.